like It's Always Sunny in Hollywood, their early work was a little too amateur for my tastes. But when Spider-Man 3 came out in 21, I think they really came into their own, commercially and artistically. In 23, they released this, Episode 108, American Psycho, their most accomplished work. And that's what we're talking about today. Hey, it's always sunny in Hollywood. But yeah, no, uh, we're from America. We're psychopaths in some sense. It works. I'm Lugia, by the way. Let's see uh, Patrick's introduction. Hi, I'm Patrick. And really, Spider-Man 3, you think that's where we peaked? I don't know. I asked Red this before we started, and he said, yeah, no, Spider-Man 3 was where we kind of got good, or at least better. Really? Huh. I, I was just, like, looking through the list of episodes, and, like, I, I distinctly remember, like, the stuff, like, before them were kind of, like, messy, and I remember Spider-Man 3 being a kind of good episode. So I'm like, okay, yeah, sure, that was probably our first good episode. It might have been, like, earlier, a little bit later. I don't know. But I just, that one stood out, I remember, thinking it was a good episode. You're probably not wrong. As I've said, the earlier episodes were my least favorite, at least looking back at them. Well, when do you yeah. think we, like, got better? Uh, I'd say, like, 2022. Maybe around the start of that year. So, like, everything, quote-unquote, yeah, season I, I one was, thinking... was not... Not yeah, great. If, 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 if I thought the last few, the last, like, few episodes of season... One were pretty good, and I felt there was like some good episodes, like a little bit before that. Though it was a bit more hit and miss. I'll just say this: yeah, if I like... if I if I told one of my friends, "Hey, I have a podcast. You should check it out." I wouldn't I wouldn't tell them, "Hey, like check out our earliest stuff." I mean, there's yeah, probably yeah. like a couple. I, I think our Street there's Fighter there's one is few, one of the better I, ones. I'd there, say, I'd say like go to season two. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I'm I'm Drum Arts. I don't I didn't introduce myself. Here's our third uh, psycho. Yeah. Yeah. Of the seven psychopaths. That's a different episode. Anyway, um, let's just get some brief news. Sinead O'Connor passed away. She was a um, very famous musician in the 90s, uh, best known for her song um, uh, Nothing Compares to You. And um, she also was kind of infamous for um, in uh, 1992 on SNL, she called out the church. Uh, the Catholic Church because of uh, child abuse stuff. And, and this she, was before... She, she ripped a, a picture of the Pope, right? Yeah. And this yeah. was before that was like a super like well-known thing. So um, it was very controversial at the time, although I guess she uh, she became vindicated in history. Rest in peace, Sinead. Uh, another musician passed away. That was um, Randy Meisner. Uh, Randy Meisner was... a. Uh, uh, well, he was one of the founding members members of the Eagles, uh, the bassist and the backing harmony vocalists. Uh, he co-wrote and sang the uh, their hit song "Take It to the Limit." The Eagles is like a very uh, messy, complicated band with a kind of rough history. But uh, Randy was one of the one of the le lesser conflict driver ones. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I have yeah, something rest... kind of not funny, but I guess amusing about Sinead to go back to her for a second. You know how I know of Sinead? I mean, oh. before, before, I know of her because of the SNL scandal, but before that, you know how I knew of her? She sang a song on the Rugrats in Paris soundtrack. Ah. I'm Which like, one? oh. Uh, she sang uh, the, the song at the wedding when the kids are slow dancing with the moms, if you remember that. Oh. The song is called uh, When You Love. Okay, then. Interesting. Uh, that's, that's, apparently, that's apparently my introduction to her. Like, I was a kid. I, like I didn't know who was singing it when I was a kid, but yeah, no, no, that's interesting. Anyway, uh, one bit of interesting news because we talked about this last week, but Sound of Freedom getting a lot of uh sales and stuff. But uh, apparently, it's been come out that a lot of those sales um are not the most um how do I say legitimate? They were kind of uh, art artificially inflated. How I, the I, 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 can, I here, let me explain. At the end of, I haven't seen the movie, but I do know this. At the end of Sound of Freedom, there's a QR code on the screen and a message saying, if you know somebody who wants to see the movie but can't afford to do it, this will get them free tickets. So yeah, so basically people are paying for the tickets, but basically just like the few people that are watching it are paying for like 10, 12 tickets or whatever. And um, yeah, that's why the sales are, and that, that's why there's so many people, like, because there's been a lot of reports of people being like, I go into the theater, it's like completely empty. So like, but it's sold out, and uh, yeah, th this is basically why. 
personally, I think it's like pretty scummy. Like not just like because it's like a, this lying thing, but I think it's kind of like messed up to. I feel like they're kind of preying on old people because it's uh, from what I understand, the movie is like very much like, oh, if you pay for these tickets, you'll save the kids, and it's like all this like kind of fear mongering shit, and um, I think that's I think that's kind of like ethically dubious. Apparently, it crossed like 150 million now. You know, clearly not doing like the numbers that Barbie and Oppenheimer are doing. Apparently, Barbie and Oppenheimer, uh, they both grossed more than um, what's it called, uh, Mission Impossible, which is uh, interesting to me that you know a, a huge you know Mission Impossible flick made less money than a period drama and uh, uh, a, a comedy. You know, Do you think that's period. partly because of the meme? Maybe, Probably. but I'll, Probably. I think well, even even, like, even then, even then, the Barbie marketing team especially has really gone above and beyond. I'm surprised that like Oppenheimer did that well. That's the part that surprised me. Um, I do think part of it may be because of um the memes. I don't really think the memes really drove us that much though. I do think though that um I feel like maybe audiences they're kind of I guess tired of blockbusters now because you know we've had they've been kind of the dominant movie for like the last decade and you know there used to be a lot more variety in films. I think people are more willing to support you know variety and whatnot. I'm down for that. Not everything needs to be a franchise. Yeah, speaking of Barbie and Oppenheimer, I did uh, get to see him this week. Uh, not back to back, but you know, I did see him. So I guess I'll I'll briefly go into Barbie thoughts, and then both of us can go into Oppenheimer if you're up for it. Yeah. Uh, wait, have you seen Oppenheimer? Yeah, I did. I have. Uh, oh, last okay. week. All three of us? Okay, all three of us. Lugia, have you seen Barbie yet? No, I have not. All right. Uh, to give uh my quick summary, um. I guess similar thoughts to to Patrick, where I'm I'm a bit mixed on it. Uh, I think I lean a bit more positive though. Um, first of all, this I believe this movie was a giant marketing ploy by Mattel to increase the sale of Ken dolls, because he was very clearly the show stealer, and um, and like the whole thing is like, oh, you know, Ken stands on his own, so like whatever like little boys got dragged to the movie by their sisters or whatever, they're gonna be like, yeah, I'm gonna buy a Ken doll and play with him myself. But yeah. Anyway, I thought it was pretty cute, you know, had a, a great absurdist uh, humor and visual comedy. Um, I really like this, uh, how like it had this heightened reality where like, there's some lines that are like really kind of weird and unnatural. And I feel like in any other movie, I would like think that it's a kind of bad line, but because of like the tone, it loops back around to being funny. And I don't think it blew my mind. I wouldn't say like there's anything in here that I haven't seen in like Wreck-It Ralph or Nightmare Before Christmas or, you know, Pleasantville, Lego Movie, any stuff like that. But, um... It's charming. Very charming. Let's see, does have some pretty overt feminism talking points, uh, especially towards the end, because, you know, duh, you know, why wouldn't they? But I, I found, like, it was a bit more tongue-in-cheek than I feel like some people were, uh, like, getting at. Like, I think it's incredibly funny that um, they saw the problem via voting. Like, that, that's just an incredibly, like, funny ending to, like, you know, the, the, this giant, like, civil war is happening, and then they're like, while they're distracted by this, they voted, and that's how they won. Like, that that feels to me like um, they're almost like kind of poking fun at like some DSA talking points or whatever. Uh, my mom liked it a lot. I saw it with her. Uh, probably because of like the big uh motherhood theme. Um, I thought Ken was an obvious show stealer. He was written pretty smart because uh, I felt like his exploration of the themes was a lot more character driven. Um, again, I I don't. I thought the um, the talking points, you know, in the last act were pretty sharp, but um, you know, they very like they laid on pretty thick, where they just kind of like tell the audience this stuff. When I felt with Ken, it was more of a show, because um, and I felt like he was broadly relatable to both men and women, because obviously, like his role in the movie is like, you know, it, it is a role reversal thing, where like you know he's the oppressed group, so basically his struggle is very relatable to women, but like the central. The central thing of his like insecurity is, I guess, more relatable to men. So I feel like his character was able to really tap into like both audiences in terms of relatability. Oh, one more thing. I thought the 2001 parody was really smart because um, one not only is it a good, a good effective opener that sets the tone of themes, but um, I thought it tied really well when um the 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 same song played when uh, Ken learns about the patriarchy because um, it basically has like the same context of like this is like when their minds got opened or some shit. Um, and it, it, it's definitely funny when you, like, consider it within the context of, like, 2001. So basically I'm saying it's probably the best example of a good reference joke because it's really strong within the internal context of the film, but, like, it works. There's, like, an extra layer if you are familiar with the original film. 
Overall, I thought Barbie was pretty good. I gave it a 7 out of 10. Uh, thumbs up. Highly recommend. Apparently there's a World War II joke in Barbie. Um, I don't remember. No? There might have been. Maybe. If it was, then... I don't, I don't know. I, I, I saw the movie twice. I didn't catch it. I don't know. I just heard about it know. from a friend who also saw the movie. Did they say what the joke been, was? They have a lot of, they no. have a lot of kind of quick fire jokes. Uh, I, from my experience, I do not remember a World War II joke. Well, speaking of World War II, In, yeah, that, that, that is a segue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not wrong. So, um, yeah, Oppenheimer. Very heavy film. I saw this with my whole family. I thought this movie was amazing. I think it's the best movie of the year and the best movie of Christopher Nolan's career, which is, uh, which I know doesn't mean a lot because I'm, I'm very critical of Christopher Nolan, but no, I thought this was a masterpiece. 9 out of 10, 10 out of 10, it's amazing. Yeah, no, I'm with the same bo- on the same boat as you. I This is probably the best movie of the year. I don't know if it's my favorite from Nolan. I'm a big Memento fan. But it does hit some of those Memento notes. And favorite, yeah, yeah I, I definitely enjoyed this one a lot, although it was a lot to take in. I also saw this with Elias, and he has a lot to say about the movie, too. Well, if you guys are cool, I can... Oh, uh, Patrick, do you have any quick thoughts before I, I jump in? Um, again, I, I'm no, I, I saw it once. I feel like it's a movie I need to see again. All right. Really collect myself. Um, I'm going to jump into some thoughts uh, you guys can add on any time. Okay. But um, I want to start with the editing, because I think this is some of the best editing I've seen in a film, especially at, for this scale. Um, I thought it had, like, this really rhythmic, like, engaging style where it kind of felt like a metronome, where, like, it kept jumping around to different points in time but it felt like very control like there was like a snappy pace to it and i felt it was really effective at creating all these associations through the scene pairing yeah no because like the, the pace just, was really well done even for a three-hour movie scenes go by very quick yeah it didn't feel three hours like it felt big but it didn't feel like I, yeah I no this this tired. felt like two hours maybe even two and a half i liked with like because it jumps through different points in time it ends up creating all these like different associations and like Thing is that you keep in the back of your head while you're seeing all these different scenes instead of like if it was done chronologically or something. Um, it also does this thing where like uh, the black and white segments were meant to be like objective viewings of the scene, but then um, some of those scenes get repeated, but in the color, which is uh, meant to be a much more subjective, you know, through Oppenheimer's eyes things or through. Um, oh, okay. Because initially I thought the black and white segments were supposed to be after the bombs were launched. Yeah, no, the black and white was just meant to be, like, uh, objective. Yeah. Okay, okay, but, um, that makes more sense now. I thought it was, like, interesting how they, like, because the, the black and white stuff is there's these, like, very, like, dry, objective scenes, and then the color sequences, sometimes they get, like, very impressionistic with the imagery. You know, things would get incredibly surreal, because, uh, again, we're seeing things all through Oppenheimer's point of view. And, like, ultimately, I feel like it culminates into making, like, it's feeling more like an abstract painting of a man's life, which I think is ideal for a biopic, because, like, it gives you a window into the man's head rather than it just being a uh, recreation of his Wikipedia page. And some real surreal imagery, though. Like, uh, I-, I keep thinking of the, um, I think one of the best scenes in the movie is uh, the crowd scene after he drops the bomb and he's, like, talking to all of his students because you have, like, uh, the rhythmic stomping and, like, he sees all this, like, radiation damage to, like, the students and stuff. And then you got all the sound stuff. It's And he walks it's, over, uh, like, a charred body, like, when he's leaving. Yeah, insane sequence um i think the sound design and score really really gave everything like a, a a strong weight to it and it really is supported by the editing i thought the bomb drop sequence was fucking that outstanding. was really well was, um, done when it when the test uh when the test bomb hits it's silent for like a minute yeah i like uh, it does like that uh the lightning thing where like you see the light first and then the sound happens yeah and you, you kind of just take in the imagery and then the just the deafening noise and it was like holy shit you know I know you said I have become deaf. Uh, deaf. You should have said I have become deaf because holy shit, my ears <laughs> are ringing after that. Performances were really astounding. Um, if, and like, there's so many good performances. Like, it's hard to really like name a highlight. Uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s one has like really kind of wormed his way into my head because like, there's so much there, and it's like especially impressive. Like, because I don't see Robert Downey Jr. at all, and like, I always kind of felt like he had more of like a limited range like prior because um he usually just plays kind of the similar wise ass where he plays an insane person but here he like he really outdid himself here and i i hope he like 
this man has impressive range. I think Jason Clark, yeah, Jason Clark, he was the guy that was like interrogating Oppenheimer in the last third, uh, Roger Robb. His character, I thought, was like very compelling as like an antagonistic force. A lot of, lot of great performances. Uh, career best for almost everyone involved. Um, even those with little screen time were able to like leave a pretty big impression. You know, beyond just being a recognizable actor, but like they actually felt like a distinct character. It really feels like a sensor experience too. Like I feel like with a Nolan style, he's got like this very like didactic, like um, particular thing where like uh, he's very like uh, obsessed with like plot mechanics and stuff. But other times, he's completely like doesn't care about that. And he just wants you to like let everything wash over you. And I feel like this is the first time he's ever really juggled the two extremes of a style well. Because like previously, his other attempts to juggling weren't really great, and uh, his best moves were either like fully go into one direction or fully go into the other. Like Memento fully went into the uh, the plot mechanism stuff. By the way, here I kind of felt like there's a lot of moments where you're just meant to kind of feel and take it in and just let the emotions and weight of everything kind of hit you. Um, but other scenes have like such really rich dialogue and attention to detail that it encourages like a much more active engagement, which I think is like cool. And so uh, some of the juggle, effects like, too. Like, you know, yeah. a couple scenes where the background like starts shaking. Yeah, I thought that was cool because like I was trying to figure out how they like shot that. And I I'm guessing what they did is like they shot it with like a 3D camera and then just like overlay the images. It was like that's that was an impressive effect. Yeah, it juggled between like a lot of different storylines and characters without really undermining or contrasting LA elements. Like, I, 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 I think this is Nolan's opus. It really applies like all the extremes of his artistic form while like kind of elevating it to a next level. It's definitely up there, like a solid nine point five, if not maybe even ten out of ten. Yeah, I give it. I give it a nine point five. Yeah, two thumbs up. Highly recommend. Uh, Patrick, you have anything you want to add? Wish I saw it in IMAX. Yeah, I might. I might rewatch it honestly, because I I didn't get to see it in IMAX because uh, theaters were sold out. I did get like the good Dolby like sound, which I think was worth it. Yeah. It's supposed to be on uh, available for IMAX for another week, or they renewed it for another week. Anyway, let's talk about American Psycho. All right, well said, my Sigma male friend. So, American Psycho was released in 2000 and was directed by Mary Heron, who you may know for I Shot Andy Warhol. But yeah. it was uh, based on the book by Brett Easton Ellis, who is a very famous novelist. He's known for um, Less Than Zero and Rules of Attraction, both which, uh, both of which were also turned into films. Less Than Zero was actually, I think, Robert Downey Jr.'s breakout role, which is uh, really funny. Yeah. Rules of Attraction was uh, from the Roger Avery, who is probably best known as um, Quentin Tarantino's writing partner. So initially, American Psycho would not even see a film adaptation because Ellis thought the whole concept behind his book was quote-unquote unfilmable. I don't know if there's any key differences between the book and the film. So I didn't get to finish the book. Um, they're, they, they're very similar, but um, there are definitely a bunch of passages in there that are like pretty different. Um, but it's got like a similar sense of humor. I think like the book did a pretty good job of capturing it, although there's, it just doesn't have like everything that's in the book in the movie. Are there like any significant exclusions? There's like this uh, one scene I remember is like, he he accidentally like stumbles into like a gay pride parade and uh naturally he's deeply homophobic but he's homophobic in a way where like you kind of think he's closeted gay i mean they do still have a scene kind of like that in the film just not with the parade but the the, the dialogue is like kind of funny because like someone compliments him and he's like oh my god i, I must i need to go home and uh <laughs> and, like he like you need to i gotta return, to go I gotta home return and, some like, videotapes he, yeah like he immediately needs to go home and, like do like some ritual to like it's like it's like just kind of funny. It was like okay, I can't accept this compliment. It's a defamation of my character. So speaking of the role of Patrick Bateman was not initially going to be given to Christian Bale. It would have been given to Billy Crudup, but he turned it down and eventually it did go to Christian Bale. But initially he had no interest because he never read the book. But then when he saw the script, he's like, all right, you know what? This is actually pretty funny. I'm in. And throughout. The filming process of American Psycho, Christian Bale would be method acting as Patrick Bateman throughout most, if not every scene. So he was in character 24-7 and he wouldn't stop. In fact, 
he and uh heron had a dinner with ellis the author of the book and christian bale was in character throughout the whole dinner and ellis is like you are the monster that i created i am scared what have you done like he liked it but he's like god damn you're my you're my son I think it was very funny how he based his performance off of Tom Cruise. Yeah, in, a, in an interview from uh, with uh, David Lover Letterman. He was also inspired by uh, Vampire's Kiss with Nick Cage's performance. See, I told you, there's parallels between them. Um, and you can kind of tell, because his voice kind of does sound like Nick Cage, because like... Well, he doesn't go for like the British like accent. No, I mean like Nick Cage in general, where like Nick Cage is like, oh, you know, I gotta, I gotta steal the Declaration of Independence, and he was like, Mm, mm. let's see let's see paul allen's declaration of independence is like you know <laughs> they got like a similar voice like uh, to me i think they kind there, of i similar. i did definitely get vibes of vampire's kiss and if you've if you've ever seen like eyes wide shut which i do believe came out the same year as this but like it's kind of funny watching this and eyes wide shut because um i do feel there's like a very there's similarities in the performances in cruise in that movie and uh christian bale in this one Oh no, this came out the year after Christian uh, Eyes Wide Shut. Uh, I got one fun fact, and it was, you know the uh, the Paul Allen death scene? Yeah. So, during rehearsals, Jared Leto, who played Paul Allen, was excluded from that scene, only because when they actually started filming that scene for real, his reaction to Christian Bale coming at him with an axe would be genuine. Oh, okay, interesting. Why is Jared Leto in so many movies like that are weirdly iconic? I don't know. He's in this. He's I'm in Fight Club. Like I'm not expect. Like I'm not expecting him to be in these movies. And I'm like, wait, he is. And how come he always dies in them? His best movies always have him dying some horrible death. I think it's a sign. Yes, we need to kill Jared Leto. <laughs> Unless we have a Suicide Squad or a Morbius again. This is, uh, this is not satire. This is an actual threat. <laughs> we are going to steal the declaration of Jared Leto. All right, so as for the plot, Patrick Bateman is the American psycho. Who would have thought? So he's a, he's a very wealthy man. He has a nice apartment. He's got a fiancé. Don't show him your business card or he will fucking kill you. And that's exactly what he does when he sees Paul Allen's business card in a meeting. And the rest of the movie is just him trying to cover it up, make sure no one knows, but eventually he gets found out and the world doesn't care and moves on. He's given... You can say that um, this movie is just about the regular day of a regular man because he's just like me for real. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yeah, it's uh, very... It's very episodic. light on the story. Yeah, it's very, like, episodic. It's more of just, like, kind of a day in the life of this disturbed man. Um, there's a bit more conflict once Willem Dafoe's character gets introduced. Like, he's investigating the case of Paul Allen? Uh, a neat thing they did with uh, Willem Dafoe's thing is that they shot each uh, scene with him three times. One where he's supposed to play it, like, um, he knows uh, Patrick Bateman's the killer. One where he's uh, suspicious, but not sure. And one where he doesn't believe it at all. And um, they would uh, uh, use, like, a different take for, like, each shot um, so the audience would have no idea what he the hell he's thinking, which I think is a cool detail. Yeah, I, I love that detail a lot, especially in this movie about a man who is fucking insane. Yes. So, um, I know really Red has seen this movie head. before. I want to hear what Patrick has to say. I want to hear what Patrick has to say about Patrick Bateman. So, um, uh... Go ahead. So we brought up the vampires kiss comparisons, or the we brought up the comparisons to this when we talked about vampires kiss. Uh, if you remember my reaction to vampires kiss, I was like, "What the fuck?" This is a similar "what the fuck," but a slightly more relaxed "what the fuck." So that makes any sense. Elaborate. Um, I'm not as weirded out by this as I am with vampires kiss. This is this is more violent. Where well, at least you don't see weird. Patrick Bateman trying to eat a cockroach. Yeah, at least there's that. But I don't know. I'm just I'm just like, all right. I don't know. It's it's hard to explain. I'm I'm just watching it. I'm seeing this man do this seriously insane things. He kills a homeless man for no reason. He steps on the dog. He 
almost kills a kitten, and then he shoots an old lady. And I'm just like, Jesus Christ. Yes, he's not a, a good person. To put Which it is lightly. why people no, look no, up he... to him. No, um, yeah, a lot of people... Well, I, will uh, say, I will say, I do like this a bit more than Vampire's Kiss. I would definitely say it's a much more put-together movie than yeah. Vampire's Kiss. I will say, this is one of the few movies where I did not know what to think of the ending, and I actually needed to re-watch it. Um, because uh, the first time I saw the ending, I was like, what's going on? I was, yeah. Once I'm confused anymore, I kind of feel I kind of settled on interpretation. Uh, but yeah, uh, ending definitely gets pretty surreal. We can go into that a little bit later, like once we're almost done talking about the film, because I want to hear what you guys have to say about that. Anyway, um, so very funny movie. Uh, you know, everyone already makes the memes of it, but uh, it's it's generally got like a, very, a great like dark sense of humor, like great kind of comedic timing um and like kind of exaggeration to it which uh i think is pretty great yeah, patrick bateman is a very funny character even though he's this killer this loose maniac like hearing him in a conversation you're like oh my god who the fuck is this guy and it it's just so funny like when he talks to other people there's this one dinner scene where he keeps bringing up all these important topics in a row like we need to talk about racial issues our economic problems we need to support women's rights like all in all in one sentence to make him sound like the most important person in the room i think it's incredibly funny how um how much they really emphasize how he is utterly interchangeable and kind of a, a boring person outside of the fact that he's a serial killer like if it wasn't for the serial killer thing he would just be um a guy he'd be generally a nobody that he would have no no personality at all. Um, although there, there is like this implication because like he does like as much as like the Huey Lewis and the news thing is meant to kind of show that he um he has no taste and he's just kind of this soulless consumer. Is there is like a genuine passion there? So I kind of feel like there is like something under the surface, but he's you know there's just something off about him in a way. Yeah, some kind of have this, abstract he does entity. Have this salesman like attitude, especially like before he before he kills somebody. Yeah. It, like um, he's just he's just he just goes on about like music like and this album is da 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 and this is, and he has that like that tone of voice almost like a salesman yeah so to show you like he discovered how fake he really tourism is. before most people did yeah this is probably gonna seem kind of insane uh have you played Persona Four no are, are you not played are I've you gonna draw Persona a parallel to Wadachi yes. It's just like Adachi. This is Adachi's favorite movie, man. This is, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, damn, you you already know the twist. I mean, it's an obvious twist in the game, but you know, everyone okay. spoiled it for me. I haven't yeah, even touched also, like, the game, and I already know. When I first played the game, like literally, like a half hour in, I was just like, "It's definitely Adachi, right?" It was like, I was like, there's, "There's like no other way." Like, duh, of course it's him. They don't really do like a good job of like really throwing you off the trail. I have to ask. There are some iconic scenes in the film. Which one's your favorite? Because of the memes, I always crack up at uh, why isn't it possible? At the end? Why isn't it possible? Yes. It's why? just not. Why not, you stupid bastard? Yeah, I don't know. Um, God. Uh... Why, what's yours? It's actually really one of the very like... first scenes that we see of really Patrick like... Bateman. Sorry, you go, Red. I was going to say, I really do like the scene where... Um... He's uh like where Willem Dafoe is kind of interrogating him. That's not like a, that's not like a comedy scene, but I, I just really like it. But uh, because in the in the beginning of the movie, uh, it's a dinner setting. They're at a restaurant, and it's just Patrick Bateman talking with his coworkers, and it's a very normal conversation. And then the very next scene, you go to a club. He goes to the bartender. He's like, "Here, take my credit card." She's like, "It's a cash only bar." She turns around. And then Patrick says, you're a fucking ugly bitch. I want to stab you to death and then play around with your blood. And that's the first moment you get to see Patrick Bateman being unhinged. And that just sticks with you for the rest of the movie. And he says it in the mirror reflection. Yeah. <laughs> doing what he truly is inside. But obviously, the Paul Allen murder scene is like the most iconic part of the film. The business card scene is also up there. Pretty funny, very sharp commentary throughout. Um, what did you think of cinematography? 
I kind of like the kind of blandness to the colors and like the very kind of flat look to it all. It feels very uh, really emphasize the kind of soullessness. Also, like yeah, the, the close the close cut-ins to his sweaty face are pretty funny. This is like a movie like people wouldn't say it's beautiful, but like it really like fits the material. It's more of a character study. A character study of a man that's like has so many like layers of irony. It's kind of like hard to really get at who he is deep down under it, which I think is interesting because like you, there's like some legwork from the audience end of things, which is cool. You guys have anything else you want to say before we go to the ending? One point, a guy says, "Can you be quiet? I'm trying to do drugs," and I don't know if I got a laugh out of me. All right. So, yeah, so first time well, I saw it, I hold got, up, hold up. I, I want to hear Patrick say what he thinks about the yeah, ending. What do you think um, happened, or why things were the way they were? In in what sense? No, just like what do you think was the point of the ending? I think the point is. I, I think the point is he was so good at being nobody, at just being a face in the crowd, that the fact that he did all this outlandish stuff is just too impossible to believe. And I guess that's just supposed to say like how anybody can be seriously deranged, anybody can be a psychopath. I definitely think that um, there is this element of... Uh... One, like, when I first thought, I was like, wait, so is this real? And like my thing is, like, it was real. Um, maybe not in the exact way he thought it was but uh yeah there's definitely this element that like he is there's there's truly nothing special about him and that um it could be anyone you know everyone confusing him for paul and all that stuff is just because they're really interchangeable there's nothing special about him you know he uh as memed on as the um the card scene is it's it's very much like meant to show that um there is no fundamental difference they will try really really hard to find a difference and the fact that he's not recognized uh, as patrick bateman is a punishment Mm -hmm. he has no identity yeah that's what i think too and what i find interesting and this might not be correct but i think that everyone else that uh bateman associates with is also a psycho in their own way you know, now that you actually like mention it, like the yeah, this is a man that's like very desperately trying to cling on to this identity and like feel like someone. He's constantly and, um, trying to end. prove himself better than others. Like that's what the whole business card scene is all about. Everyone's like, showing really? their business cards yeah, and they think that won't theirs even go is to better. A restaurant unless he has a reservation. Yeah, he wants to be somebody, but he just uh, never will be. And one of the clues that led me to think this was a couple times throughout the movie. Patrick Bateman would always identify something relating to Donald Trump. Which is really funny um, back then, and it's even funnier now. But at the end of the movie, when he's talking to his lawyer, he ignores them. He says, hey, is that Edward Towers? So these people look up to different wealthy, successful people. So they're kind of the same. So what if everyone else is also secretly a killer. Possible. Delivering all of us. And, 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 that just, and that just goes back to the fact that everyone is interchangeable. They have similar interests. They just want to prove that they're different when they're not. I know some people say, like, oh, it's just a dream, but I don't buy that theory. I feel like it's supposed to mean something more. It's also kind of a lame cop-out, don't you think? Yeah. Actually, I think uh, Mary Heron also says, like, yeah, no, it, it's not supposed to be a dream. Like, th- this stuff does happen. There's just a different way of showing why it's shown the way it is. Anything else? I don't think so. Actually, this is unrelated to the movie at hand, but since we're probably never going to talk about it, have either of you guys seen American Psycho 2? I... Nope. Well, I haven't. I might at some point. Not by my own free will, though. Because, all right... Let's just get this out of the way, because we're probably never going to talk about it on the podcast. American probably Psycho not. 2 is not American Psycho 2. It was never meant to be American Psycho 2. It was meant to be a completely different film, altogether, completely unrelated to the original source material. But then someone yeah. said, hey, yo, we could just tie this into American Psycho. So they called it American Psycho 2, and they added a scene at the beginning where Patrick Bateman is killed by a baby girl. That happened? I think, like, the original American Psychos 2 was meant to be, like, a Heather's or Jennifer's body thing, but then they just, like, randomly made it an American Psycho thing. 
Okay, so then. we're we're not gonna talk about that movie. I don't want to talk about that movie. It's not worth watching. And I have no interest. So, Red, I guess it's in your hands. Why well, is it in my hands? Because neither of us are gonna talk about it. Yeah, I'm not talking about it either. All right, All right cool. Then it's, then it's in not, nobody's we're never, hands. We're never but gonna do it, it an episode. Toss it on in it. the bin with Hoodwink Two. Yes, this is uh, being. I don't know, but he's getting sent to the to the dead zone. What other movies are in the dead zone? Uh, music. The rest of the Resident Evil live action movies. No, it's not. That's not in the dead zone. Sorry. Okay. Well, that's all you then. Yeah, that's all me. We've talked about. This. I think me and me and Lugia have said what movies we just don't want to talk about, but. Red, you're like, no, nah, no, nah, well, let's just put a pin in that. To boldly flee. We're I talking expect, about I, to boldly flee eventually. I've told you guys I don't want to talk about Last Airbender because there's no point. Yeah. yeah I, Last Under, we're probably not, not going to talk about because I don't. I'm I'm much more interested in like the Shyamalan movies that are like people are mixed on, not the ones that people just hate. We may talk about the happening. I don't see my us ever talking about After Earth or The Last Airbender film. And I am a okay with that. It's not even the movie itself, it's just I don't want to add to the conversation because there's nothing to add. It's one of the worst movies of all time. Yeah. Allegedly. I don't care. No, I've seen it. It's not good. Even though I think Shaman's a good director, he uh he dropped the ball there. Definitely. So final thoughts? Uh I don't know, honestly. This is a this is a tough movie to talk about on my end. Really? Yeah. Any reason? I don't know. It's it's just one of those movies where I'm like, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. Did you enjoy it? I enjoyed it, yes, but what did you not like about it? I, d- I think it's just like satirical things. It's just harder for him to really like articulate his thoughts on, maybe. Yeah, I. Yeah, I feel like, like both kind of surreal and yeah. Again, yeah, that was that was one of the reasons I was I, it was hard for me to talk about. But I'm a cheerleader because I didn't fully understand it. I guess this is a similar ballpark. Yeah, no, it definitely has a similar kind of tone to "But I'm a Cheerleader." I'll rewatch this again one day. Maybe I'll fully collect myself. But I'm I'm sorry if I disappointed you. No, no, it's okay. Uh, your recommendation, Patrick. Right. Okay. So thought about it and you know on this podcast we've talked about a bunch of different subjects and topics and we're going to talk about a bunch of different subjects and topics but one one thing i'm surprised we have not talked about is dinosaurs land before time hell yeah <laughs> slow down there eager mcbeaver <laughs> and and it is this year does mark the 30th anniversary of jurassic park but that would be too obvious. And you know me, I don't like to be obvious. So I'm Jurassic going Park for a, I'm going for a different dinosaur movie. Or should I say a different dinosaur story? Next week is we're back, a dinosaur story. Okay. What what is this? It's an oddball choice. I've never seen it. The only thing I know I about it is that it's the only thing I know about it is that it's not great. Not terrible, but so, it's not great. Is this going to be That's another because... Romeo and Juliet sealed with a kiss thing? Maybe, because no. it is the same director. Oh, no! It is. Are you it is. serious? He's one of the Patrick. four directors on this. He's one of the four Patrick. directors on this movie. Why? I guess I'm a, he's... I'm a curious all right, man. Alright, alright. Okay, two, okay. We've talked about two movies from this, from this man before we did Two, uh, God, what are some other directors we've done? We've done, uh, look, you can you, be, look, look, you know, look, I can, we have I multiple can, times. guys, I can put your worries at ease. He didn't make this movie by himself. Yeah, yeah. Jay no, Leno is in this? Like yeah, I know. It didn't like Nostalgia Critic talk about this once. I think that's no. where I, I know this from. Okay, um, if this is anything of a similar quality, we need to watch this together like we did with Romeo and Juliet. You know, initially, what I thought, what there was like, for for a brief moment, I thought, oh, is he gonna suggest Tammy and the T Rex, which is another shitty dinosaur movie? I've never heard of that movie in my life. 
It's just a brief thought. I didn't know if you did or if you didn't. No. All I know about Tammy and the T Rex is in um the in this one Rick and Morty video game, they just have like the entire movie playing on this one TV. Wait, really? Yeah, in High on Life, like you can just watch Tammy and the T Rex in the game. Huh. You learn something new every day. I don't know. Consider this a curiosity pick. I see this movie floating around on the internet from time to time. Wait, you've heard of where have you heard of this before? I'm talking about We're Back. Yeah, I know. Where have you heard of this movie before? I don't, it's just, it's been brought up occasionally. By who? Because of the nostalgia critic. No, it's, no, I heard this from somebody else. It's usually brought up when people talk about dinosaur movies. Oh. What? Oh. What? It's a musical. Okay. It, it says, is? it says that there are songs in the movie. Ask again, do you want to watch this together? I, yeah, why not? All right. Unless you don't want to. I, I have no objections. It was bad, so we probably should, right? And I, don't, I don't know. It's only an hour and 13 minutes. It's short. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, yeah, so is Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, but again, he didn't, he didn't make this by himself. Yeah, listen, I have nothing against the guy. But I'm also suffering from PTSD here. Does it ease your pain knowing that Spielberg produced? No. <laughs> okay. He's not a good producer. <laughs> unfortunately. Anyway, uh, it looks like it'll be fine. Like the animation looks good, so you know it probably won't be terrible. We'll see. I'm gonna be cautiously optimistic. Have an open mind. Anyway, uh, you got a closer? I have to go and well, know I can't be associated with these dinosaurs. I have to return some videotapes. <laughs> <laughs>